Now, it turns out that often we want to symbolize natural language. What do I mean by natural language? I mean things like English, Chinese. You know, we get you know a bunch of prose. What we want to do is turn it into symbols, right? Like P Q blah 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 blah, right? Well, why would we want to do that? Turning it into symbols lets you really focus on the logical form of the argument in a way where you're not distracted, right? You won't care whether the propositions, the sentences, or the claims made in that natural language prose is interesting. You might not care whether it's true or false. And you might not be carried away, carried away by rhetoric, you know. You know, if you, you know, let's say you go to the car dealership and you encounter a salesman, right? The salesman is going to bombard you with rhetoric, right? They're going to try to convince you to buy that car, right? But if you really break down what they're saying into its logical form, you might realize that it's not. So reasonable after all, despite the salesman making it sound so reasonable. Ah,、oh, well, you know, you need this car, you need this extra upgrade because blah 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 blah, right? Lets you focus on the logical form if you symbolize. There's a second reason: it clears up any ambiguities that arise in natural language. Japanese is infamous for this. Japanese has so much ambiguity. Chinese has some. English is. Probably a bit better in that regard than Chinese. Maybe Latin. Actually, I don't know. Maybe Latin has quite a few ambiguities as well. Maybe German a bit less. But German is very similar to English. They both have Germanic origins. Now, here's an example of ambiguity. If I say to you. I'm going to the gym, or I'm going to the swimming pool. There are two ways you can interpret this. You might think, okay, I'm going on. Sorry, I'm going to go to only one of those. Or you might think that it's possible that I go to both of them. And whether, and which one of these you might. Which are, which one of these interpretations you might take really depends on the implicature, the context, and so on. Right now, if I was at a restaurant and the waiter asked me, "Do I prefer soup, or would I rather have the soup or the salad?" Then, by the context, I think he's only asking me, or he's asking me which one of these, but not the other. Do I want? Right. In logic, these ambiguities are removed. We'll consider the or again later, but that was just one example. Okay, so we do want to symbolize things. Well, let's proceed by example. That's often the best way to do it. Suppose we have the statement: "It is if it is raining, then the pavement will be wet." Well, we need a symbolization scheme here. This is what we call the scheme. W is it is raining, and P is the pavement will be wet. Well, we then symbolize this, and we symbolize it like this. Oh, this is the other way around. Sorry, that was a typo. I'll get this fixed for these slides. Okay. If it is raining, then the pavement will be wet. This is symbolized as W, arrow P. The arrow here is what's called the material conditional, and it signifies something like if. Blah blah blah. Then so if W then P. Okay, 
this is not this is not cognitively difficult, right? Six year olds can get this. Okay, but don't worry, we'll we'll encounter really complex civilizations in due time. Okay, more about civilization. We use letters P from Z out of convention. So I'll, you know, I used W and and P previously, and we should stick to P to Z. No. A to O is really reserved for other things. These symbols, they convey what are called propositions. By the way, you don't have to uh, memorize any of this. It's just helpful terminology for us moving forward. P and Z are propositions and propositions describe states of the world, right? States of the universe. The sky is blue. James likes cheesecake. No. 50 is larger than 48. And these propositions have truth values. They're either true or false as a matter, as a matter of objective fact. Okay? Now, questions are not propositions. If I ask you, oh, did you eat breakfast this morning? That's not a proposition. Did you eat breakfast this morning? It does not have a truth value nor does it describe the state of the world. Your answer might be a proposition. Your answer might be, oh, I had breakfast this morning. That could be either true or false, right? Of course, if you're lying, then it's false. Or if it's false, you're lying. Now, imperatives are not propositions. What are imperatives? They're like commands. If I say things like, you know, sit down, shut up. Now that's an imperative. And that's not a proposition either. It doesn't have a true value. It doesn't have, it doesn't describe a state of the world. Propositions describe states of the world. Okay. That's really sort of the building blocks of sentential civilization, of the very basics. And I think a lot of this is quite intuitive, right? When you see, you know, P, arrow, Q, you kind of know what that means. But it's good for us to be explicit about this as we move forward. What we're going to do is try to, you know, build the house here. We need to build the foundation first and then move up a level. Now, you know, you look at P, arrow, Q, and you're like, oh, that's really simple. Well, we have to talk about it in order for us to move up a level. So let's talk about the material conditional. The material conditional can be captured by this arrow thing. Sometimes it appears differently, right, as this thing. I think maths use this a lot. And this thing as well. By the way, there are ASCII codes for this. So you can type this in your computer. If not, you can draw it out or you can copy and paste. Now in this course, we'll just stick with one, just be consistent. But if you, you know, write something else in the exam, you won't, I won't mark it wrong. But let's just stick with this. Okay, now the material conditional, it you know, conveys something like if, then, right? When you see a material conditional in a sentence, that sentence, sentence is going to be, well, can be translated as a conditional statement, right? So in this case, we might say that it is raining, or we should say that it is raining as the antecedent and the sidewalk will be wet is the consequent. And we should put the antecedent before the arrow. You know, if the antecedent is W and the consequent is P, then we should do it this way and not say P entails W. Make sure you get it the right way around. And you can make sure you get it the right way around just by thinking about it. You know, it's not too hard. Okay, that's the material conditional. Now, sometimes we want to negate propositions. We want to say that the proposition is false. So suppose we want to negate R, where R is, it is raining. How do we do that? Well, we put a symbol in front of it. What symbol? We put this tilde thing. If we say just R by itself, we mean it is 
raining. If we put till the R, what we're saying is it is not raining. Okay, got it? Okay, easy peasy. What's going on here? Let's see. Okay, yes. Now, not or in English might have several different forms. You know, there might be things that convey not or other than it is not raining. You might say it is not the case that it is raining. That's still not or. You might say it is false that it is raining. That's still not or. Okay. Oh, by the way, sometimes people use this. That's fine. In this course, let's stick with stick with the tilde. Okay. I'm going to introduce one or two more logical operators or symbols. Suppose we have the following sentence. It is raining and the football game is on tonight. Let's say this is our symbolization scheme. Okay, oops. Let's say that's our symbolization scheme. How do we symbolize this statement? Well, we can use this symbol to convey something like and. If we write R, you know, the little hat, S, you're saying both R and S. You're asserting that it is raining and the football game is on tonight. This hat is called the conjunction. There's actually a different way of saying the same sentence, and that's to say S conjunction R. In logic, these mean the same thing. If you say the football game is on tonight and it is the raining, that's logically equivalent to the other way around. Namely, it is raining and the football game is on tonight. I know in English, you might try to, you know, employ a bit of rhetoric and emphasize one over the other, you know, saying something like, it is raining and the football game is on tonight emphasizes that, look, you know, it's raining, but people are still playing football. But if you do it the other way around, you might mean something different. The football game is on tonight and it is raining. You know, maybe you're not, you know, uh, as concerned with the rain as in the previous case. But in logic, they're exactly the same. Any questions? Okay. Let's do some exercises. So I hope you have pen or paper. If you have the ability to write on a screen, please do. But don't write it in the Zoom meeting. Okay, don't you know, write it for everyone to see. So there's a simplization scheme here. What I want you to do is answer question one, two, and three. So do all three questions. I'll give you two minutes. Now, if you're finished, please type in the chat that you're finished. So I know, oh, well, don't, please don't type the uh, answer in the chat just yet. But if you're finished, do say you're finished so I can judge how long you guys normally take for these kind of things. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think I'll give you one more minute. None of this should be hard. This is all cognitively very easy but appreciate it for the time being because when we get to predicate logic it's going to uh, it's going to hurt your head uh wait somebody was saying something can you repeat that if you were asking a question okay i they didn't repeat the question so that's fine
Okay, one of your mics on. Let me just mute it. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, let's let's proceed. Okay, let me see. Okay, let's do this one together. The coffee was bitter and I am not late for my meeting. So what's coffee is bitter, that's P. And I am not late for my meeting. So that should be not R. Be careful of the not here. Okay. Did anyone get anyone? Did anyone get anything different? Okay, let's do number two. The floor was not wet, and it is not the case that James is a pediatrician. The floor was not wet. Look at the symbolization scheme. I see that the floor is wet. It's Q, but what we're saying is it is not wet, so we say not Q. And it is not the case that James is a pediatrician. Of course, it is not the case. It's just a variant of saying James is not a pediatrician. So it is not S. Did anyone get anything different? Okay, so number three, it is not the case that coffee was not bitter. Ha ha. There are two knots. Okay. What's the answer? Can somebody tell me? Okay, somebody said double negative. They can't say each other out. That is indeed true. So the coffee was bitter. It's P. You can actually say P or you can say not, not P. These are logically equivalent. So if you said either of these things, you would have got it correct. Okay, cool. Let's move on. So easy, right? Okay, let's do, let's, let me check the time. Let's do disjunction. Let's introduce one more symbol, a logical operator. So the hat was conjunction and it means and. What do you think a disjunction means? So a disjunction is most similar to the English connective or, but they're not exactly the same. Take the following example. For today's exercise, I will run or row for 30 minutes. Now, this junction is given by the symbol, you know, this symbol here that's approximating a V. If running was P and rowing was Q, or running for 30 minutes was P and rowing for 30 minutes is Q, then we might symbolize the above by P disjunction Q, where disjunction is like this V thing. Yeah. Okay. But it gets trickier. In English, there are two senses of the or. Somebody asked about this last time, and I talked about it briefly earlier today. We'll consider it more in depth now. There is what's called the inclusive sense, and there's what's called the exclusive sense. In the inclusive sense, more than one of the disjuncts can be true at the same time, but they don't both have to be true. Okay. Here's an example. Did you bring an umbrella or a raincoat? What we mean here is, okay, did you bring an umbrella? Did you bring a raincoat? Or did you bring both? Right? You might be asking, did you bring an umbrella and a raincoat? But under the exclusive sense, 
only one of the disjuncts can be true. So I use the restaurant example, and I think this is a really good one. You know, seldom do any restaurants let you choose more than one starter. So under the exclusive sense of or, you can only have one of these. As your starter, would you like a soup or a salad? So in English, when we use or, sometimes we mean inclusive, sometimes we mean exclusive. I mean, it depends on the situation, right? I mean, maybe some of you can think of cases where uh, the inclusive usage is a bit more clear or where everyone agrees that it's inclusive. But I think this one, the restaurant one, is a good example of the exclusive sense because restaurants rarely let you pick two, right? Now, in our logical system, the disjunctive symbol is always going to mean inclusive. It's always going to be the inclusive or. When you say P, disjunction Q, what you're saying is, look, P could be true and Q would be, can, uh, is false, or Q is true and P is false, or both of them are true at the same time. This is what this symbol means. We can actually put this on a truth table. Okay, so here's a table. Don't be scared off by it. It'll become very clear to you in due course. P and Q, these things here, they're the propositions. There are atomics. How do we read this table? Well, we read it from row to row. What this is saying here is, look, under the situation where P is true, let me change color here. Under the situation where P is true and Q is true, what can we say about P disjunction Q? Now, given that this is the inclusive sense, then if P is true and Q is true, we say that P or Q is also true. Next row, if P is true and Q is false, you know, if we have only the soup but not the salad, then P disjunction Q is also true. Same thing here, if P is false and T is true, we have the salad but not the soup, then we can say P or Q is also true. However, if both P and Q are false, then under the disjunction, P or Q is false. Okay. There's only one situation in which the disjunction is false, and that is if both disjuncts, what we call the disjuncts, P or Q, is false. Okay, does everybody get how to read this? It's pretty simple. We'll do a lot of these sorts of things. In fact, we'll do one now. So let's try to fill out the exclusive sense of the or. Actually, let's not do this. I think this is actually liable to confuse you. So let's not do this. I'm scared you'll get confused because this is not the right notation. Okay. Let's see. Okay, let's do some recap. We've got a few minutes left and I think we'll break for the day, but let's recap. We've encountered atomic sentences P to Z, the material conditional, the negation, the conjunction, and the disjunction, which is inclusive. Uh, yellow is horrible to read. The inclusive. Okay.